and a very good evening to everyone and welcome to the Professor N. R. Kamath webinar. My name is Varun Punatana and the topic of today's webinar is Chemical Engineering, Chemistry to Computers. While Chemical Engineering as a discipline has always been deeply grounded on the principles of chemistry, physics and mathematics, its initial evolution began with a strong emphasis on chemistry. However, driven by the increasing demand for chemicals and with an emphasis on efficient scale-up and operations, the chemical engineering discipline began to change its character. The increase in scale of manufacturing as well as competition for efficiency and lowering costs and regulations for environmental safety also brought in other sub-disciplines of engineering mathematics, environmental chemistry, in addition to advanced operational management. On the other hand, the chemical engineering discipline has also been hugely leveraging the advantages from the ever increasing advances in computing sciences and infrastructure at every step, beginning from the discovery of novel chemicals and materials, efficient scale-up procedures, high efficiency manufacturing and regulatory compliances. Due to this confluence of engineering and computing advances, the chemical engineering discipline has been generating an increased fundamental understanding of various phenomena, beginning from the nanoscale, to the impact at the macro scale. This knowledge has also placed chemical engineering discipline at a unique vantage point in the multidisciplinary arena to address the emerging global problems in clean energy, healthcare, environment, and sustainability. This webinar on the occasion of the birth anniversary of Professor N. R. Kamath will present thoughts and perspectives from luminaries and stalwarts of chemical engineering, tracing the path of the discipline from chemistry to computers. With that, I welcome today's speakers, Professor M.M. M. Sharma, Dr. R. E. Mashelkar, and Professor Devan Kakkar. I now request the director, Professor Subhashish Chaudhary, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Varun. I think it's a wonderful occasion that we have all assembled here uh, to celebrate the birth anniversary of one of our distinguished colleagues, okay? Uh, we I think some of our alumni and others have tried to uh, actually immortalize in the IIT system by in, uh, installing the inner Kama chair professor, as well as or, you know, trying to organize such kind of nice events. So on behalf of IIT Bombay and on my personal behalf, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome okay, three of the most distinguished chemical engineers that India has produced. They are all here today. Uh, we could get them all here in this platform. So thank you, Professor Sarma, Professor Masalkar, Professor Kakkar for joining on this platform to illuminate us and to take us to this wonderful journey of which says is a chemical engineering from chemistry to computers. So I take this, uh, you know, uh, I think the opportunity, I take the opportunity to welcome all other distinguished uh, guests on this platform and you know, to have this particular program in memory of uh, our colleague, which has been uh, uh, Professor Enar Kamat. And it's very interesting to note that this is almost coinciding with a program that normally we hold on the Teacher's Day, which actually this year we celebrated on 6th of September, today we are talking about 8th of September, just we have narrowly missed by two days. Okay. But what it probably brings in, I'm delighted to see that, you know, we have here with us in the form of teachers, probably what you may call it the Adi Guru of uh, chemical engineering, uh, who is probably responsible for so many things that has happened in India, particularly in the Western sector, but on the chemical engineering, particularly you know, also on the industrial side, okay? The person who has contributed so much, and it's really uh, a great honor for us to have Professor M.M. M. Sharma, you know, coming here and joining this. We are also delighted to have Professor Maselkar. I think when we pronounce the name, it's not only the disciple of, uh, you know, he's not only a disciple of Sir M. M. Sharma, but he himself was brought the probably the chemical, uh, the research in the in a chemical engineering area and also the other areas while being the uh, the DGCSIR 
to so close to the industry and make it a lot more translatable. And today, when we are talking about IITs and others, and when we talk about how can this make an impact to the society, how can we leverage the technology that we develop at IIT Bombay or any other academic institution. So we had a lot of such lessons to learn from Dr. Maselkar. Sir, we are very happy that you are joined today on this particular platform. And of course, the third person here, my predecessor in this particular room, okay, and one of the most distinguished contemporary chemical engineer, okay, uh, despite the fact that you are supposed to have spent in this room for 10 years, I am told even during that time, he made, uh, I mean, tremendous, I think, progress in terms of kept on publishing a lot of quality paper while being the uh, director of IIT Bombay with so much of his busy schedule. So we are delighted to have you, Professor Kakkar, also on this particular occasion. And I'm sure that today, uh, this is a great way to celebrate uh, birth anniversary of uh, Professor Enar Kamath. And I'm sure that all of us have great thing to learn from the visionaries in these three areas. And with that, I think let's listen to uh, the speakers. Thank you so much. And I hope all of you will enjoy the evening. Thank you, sir. I now request Professor Madhu Benjamu, head of the chemical engineering department, to introduce today's program and share a few words on the late Professor N. R. Kamath. Professor Madhu, you are muted. You can unmute yourself. yourself. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah, now. Okay. The late uh, Professor N. R. Kamath was an outstanding teacher and technologist who had a profound influence on his students. Professor Kamat played a decisive role as an academician and also as an administrator during the formative phase of the growth of not only the Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Bombay, but also the Institute. He was the head of chemical engineering from 1959 to 1974 and later became the deputy director of the Institute. He played a visionary role in setting up the teaching and research agenda for the department. And he was also a motivating force for both the faculty and students of the department. He was a role model and mentor to many young faculty and students. As a fitting tribute to the pioneering role he played, IIT Bombay, established a chair in his honor for the immense contributions he made to the Institute. Over the years, we had the privilege of hosting revered and eminent academicians like Professor Kaushik Basu, Professor Bruce Hajek, Professor Madhusudan, and Professor Samir Mitragotri to this chair. IIT Bombay established an Arkama chair professorship for institutional excellence. This is uh, one of the most prestigious chairs of the Institute and has been established in the memory of Professor N. R. Kama. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I further request you to introduce the first speaker of our day, uh, Professor M. M. Sharma. I would also like to inform that the speakers will be taking a few questions from the audience after their talk. Kindly type your questions in the chat box. Over to you, Professor Vinjamur. Uh, thank you, Varun, again. Uh, Professor Manmohan Sharma doesn't need introduction to this, uh, doesn't need any introduction. Um, in fact, none of the speakers today need an introduction. But for the benefit of all the participants, I would give a brief introduction to Professor Manmohan Sharma. Professor Manmohan Sharma obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from UDCT, now known as ICT, Institute of Chemical Technology, and subsequently MSc Tech from the same institute. He obtained his PhD in chemical engineering at Cambridge University in 1964. He returned to India as a professor at the University Department of Chemical Technology, they known as ICT now. He worked as a professor there for more than three decades. 
He was the director of UDCT for eight years. Professor Sharma, as uh, our director, Professor Chaudhary mentioned, made enormous contributions to chemical engineering, science, and technology. He was bestowed by several universities, including IITs, by honorary doctorates. Professor Sharma is a recipient of a number of prestigious awards and honors. The notable among them include the Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan Award in 1987 and the Padma Vibhushan Award in 2001. He was also the president of INSA from 1989 to 1990. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now invite Professor Sharma to deliver his address. Me. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm audible now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Yes. Okay. Professor Chaudhary, uh, Yvang Khakar, Ramesh Mashilkar, head of the chemical engineering department, uh, fellow faculty members, listeners, ladies and gentlemen. I'm indeed very privileged to take part in uh, today's uh, celebration. I want to start by saying that no branch of uh, engineering has made such a great impact on quality of life as chemical engineering through chemical industry. The only branch of engineering which is hooked to chemistry and now in a very large measure with, uh, with biology. Uh, please permit me to be a little anecdotal. My interaction with uh, Professor uh, Narayan Rangappa Kamath started in June 1958. I was left high and dry. The person who was supposed to guide me decided to go back to America and I was in a lurch. Somehow, I gathered some strength and knocked at the door of Professor N.R. Kamath, who was Professor of Polymer Technology. And behold, it was a long conversation. And I realized not only he was very sharp, he was quite argumentative and that hopefully I was not found um, uh, wanting. I have had a lot of lifelong association with him. We even had an R. Kamath uh, club and we used to meet for dinner at uh, um, uh, uh, residences of uh, former associates. When I joined, those were the days of slide rule, which is now a bit of a joke. Uh, because even my, my, my daughter and son asked, what is this? Because I had preserved that slide rule. I was doing lots of calculations in thermodynamics and I was swinging the computer. No, there was no shadow of computers at that time. Anyway, I still remember how plate by plate calculations for distillation will take hours, sometimes days, which you can now do in a flicker. So you see what computational um, strength uh, can do. And, you know, uh, when uh, simulations were unknown, there was no talk, even that um, uh, phrase didn't exist. First time, it became prominent was when pressure swing adsorption came. If you know pressure swing adsorption is today verbiage of uh, lety because it is for medical oxygen. It was not possible to design pressure swing adsorption plants uh, without simulations. And that also saw breakthroughs in material science about which I will be making a reference. Chemical engineering has always been an evolving subject from Glipsov gave you that what we were doing in 58, what happened in 68, 78, um, 88, 98, and now you can see for yourself, even in the pressure swing adsorption, which was a new breakthrough in the separation technology in chemical engineering, look at the major advances that are taking place today. Vacuum adsorptive uh, pressure swing adsorption, the dual feed, uh, very most modern uh, method of uh, uh, separating, which has kind of a uh, dual reflux system and all. So pressure swing adsorption, apart from materials, uh, which go whether it is zeolite or whether it is activated carbon, it is seeing also inputs of chemical engineering in a massive way. Chemical engineering and pressure swing adsorption are inseparable. I said this has been an evolving discipline. Let me take a few examples. First is the whole business of nanotechnology. Today we are making thousands of tons of nanomaterial even for as simple a material as precipitated calcium carbonate. And how 
nano nano was so important in catalysis and people discovered that how gold will not gold catalyst will not function unless it is uh, it is nano catalysis is cornerstone of uh, chemical industry practically all the processes except one or two prominent uh, processes are catalytic processes why i am applauding catalysis because without that chemical industry will not uh, thrive but also because it is multidisciplinary and how chemists physicists chemical engineers have put together you take any journal of catalysis from journal of catalysis to other you will see contributors from chemical engineering from chemistry and from physics and now material science also what is remarkable is you look at the most sophisticated spectroscopic method it is used we are now trying to design the, uh, the 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 catalyst and there is now a new talk that artificial intelligence will be used to design um, uh, the catalyst would you believe that how nmr has been used to track the performance of fixed bed reactors go back to even 60s or 70s nobody would have thought of nmr being used to track the performance of uh, fixed bed uh, reactors when i was referring to material science you know link of chemical engineering with biology material science apart from chemistry it is very important how chemical engineers and material scientists are working together i refer to adsorptive separations earlier but on the material side new breakthroughs are going to come through mof and cof and mof can give you areas as large as 3000 square meters per gram at the moment they're expensive but it won't be long before you'll find mof and cof being used uh, fairly uh, regularly one of the emerging scenes where chemical engineering will be required to solve and it's very demanding is waste to wealth the other one is there will be a new phenomenon of what we call minimalization of chemical industry why it will happen because of renewable energy coming through wind as well as <coughs> through solar in both these areas also chemical engineers have a very big role whether it is magnets whether it is the kedlar film polyvinyl fluoride film you take how chemical engineers to chemical industry are contributing in a big way people don't seem to realize the solar power and wind power devan works on composites and all let me explain how material scientists polymer scientists chemical engineers put together can revolutionize offshore wind power and that is if you can go to wings as big as 200 meters because in offshore there is no no such restriction unlike uh, on on land and it kind of expertise that is required in this is really outstanding a very very um, difficult the available renewable energy will allow distributed chemical industry and you will see any sense of electrochemical engineering it was prominent in 50s and 60s and then it took uh, a, a kind of back seat but is again on revival for two reasons because energy will be available electrical energy will be available anywhere and everywhere and two nothing is cleaner than electrons so i see now in the coming years electrochemical engineering becoming more and more important there was a reference uh, chemical engineers are now required to do two things very astute scale up how will you do astute scale up because many times for these there is no way you can put a pilot plant so cfd is the only thing that will come to a rescue so cfd is becoming more more and more uh, prominent and the kind of computational powers that you require i'm trying to be loyal to your title chemistry to computer that how i refer to uh, simulations in the case of pressure shifting i am now referring to the use of uh, computers i'll be also referring to them for another uh, uh, purpose so another part is scenarios for safety now everybody is demanding chemical industry to have safety of the same standards as in nuclear power what will be the protocol of uh, uh, of defining quantitatively safety aspects i leave it to you to to guess the other area where chemical engineers will be required to play a very very important role is in biotransformations and i'll invite your attention 
to the Nobel laureate lecture of Francis Arnold, directed evolution, that how you will be able to uh, evolve enzymes to do just about impossible tasks. One of the concluding statement was that it won't be long when we'll be able to do things better than nature. Now, surely this is, and some examples are, today you can make vanillin by fermentation. Parnassine you can make by, by, by fermentation. But what people are not realizing is, you don't you normally get dilute streams in biotransformation, like in B12. And who does all the separation? Chemical engineers. The kind of separation technology that you require in biotransformations. Plus, many have not realized that this directed evolution requires very, very complicated computational work. There are hardly any people in India at the moment, and I think chemical engineers will be well placed to look into uh, the computational work required to uh, turn around enzymes to do a far better or an impossible kind of uh, uh, kind of, uh, of, of a job. This computational work is very complicated. In something I was associated, we found one or two persons in ba Bangalore who could uh, who could do this kind of work. When I refer to separation technology, again, confluence of material scientists, polymer scientists, all have come out with membranes which allowed RO for uh, drinking water from seawater. More and more breakthroughs are coming up after we had the, the fiber, the hollow fiber base. But real breakthroughs are the following. Because we can get polymers which can stand very aggressive polar solvents like dimethyl formamide or dimethyl acetamide, we now have nanofiltration membranes which can sieve out molecules with molecular weight more than 250. It is revolutionizing many separation. Even more interesting that you have charged membranes which allow uh, the um, um, uh, separation of monovalent, divalent from monovalent. Divalent is kept and monovalent goes through. You can see for yourself. But I now uh, talk to you about something quite interesting and that is what I call the phenomenon of PPB engineering, not PPM, PPB engineering. And what Will be the when you'll be now talking of 99.9% .9 plus conversion in a reactor. What will be the fate of RTD in such cases? Because as of now, to best of my knowledge, there is no such protocol. Why I'm referring to parts per billion engineering? There are a number of APIs in pharmaceutical industry. Nobody talks of purity there. Purity is taken for granted. We are only talking of impurity profile and some cancer producing live dimethyl nitrosamine, which has to be measured at parts per billion. Take the whole field of electronic chemicals, even carbon dioxide has a purity specification far better than what goes into aerated drinks. Forget about arsine and other molecules that are used, hydrogen peroxide that is used. There you need kinds of purity. So what kind of separation technology you have for these kinds of things? And as I said, if you have conversions more than 99.9, .9, what happens to the uh, problems of back mixing and RTD? Uh, I leave it to you to, to guess. There's often a talk that we have certain technologies that are mature, like distillation, which is still the workhorse of separation. But look at the continuous advances that are taking place. Uh, there was a recent paper saying that this business of saying distillation is a mature subject. In fact, I have a statement that no technology is ever mature. You can take any technology, you will find continuous improvement in all fields. Now we, what we have seen in distillation, we have seen divided wall column, more interesting reactive distillation. Where was the protocol for design of a reactive distillation column earlier? Today we have to develop and develop computer-based programs to be able to design. It won't be long before we'll be doing reactive adsorptive separations and reactive membrane separation. Finally, I now come to crystallization. Most of the old chemical engineering literature referred to inorganic salts as relevant to fertilizers and the salt industry because salt crystallization was a real ancient subject. It was a relatively easy job to, to, to handle and you know the kind of problems that were set for us was have sulfate crystallization. All they are, and they are trivial now. We are now talking of all APIs in pharma industry. Remember, pharma industry is $1.3 trillion industry. 
where you carry out crystallization because practically all apis are crystallized practically all you are having real serious challenging problems of particle size distribution bulk density in fact i have a saying your chemistry is right product is right but is not sellable because particle size distribution is not right bulk density is not right impurity profile is not right to add to this polymorph how will you predict which polymorph will come in fact if i take a simple example of precipitation of calcium carbonate apart from giving nano what will give you calcite what will give you organite meteorite these protocols are and they will require a lot of computational work there have been a lot of talk about product engineering and formulation engineering becoming integral part of chemical engineering uh, education and i would like all teachers to look into this area because most products that we use in everyday life are formulated whether it's toothpaste or whether it is a detergent and all lastly the climate change co2 i had privilege of working on co2 absorption i am glad to see such incredible um, uh, renaissance in this area co2 removal by absorption new amines you know i recommended many new amines way back in 1963 it is back at the center stage but what is important is what will be new innovative methods of reducing energy consumption in the desorbers whether cavitation will help whether any catalyst work and waste to wealth will always remain a very challenging problem for chemical engineers and the most important uh, waste that is available in india is our bagas from these are last sugar cane sugar industry based uh, and all the residues that come from food industry they need to be processed to get value added chemical and they are not simple problem they require very advanced chemical chemical engineering i would lastly say that i would urge people to look at the amundsen report in late 70s 1980 81 what was forecast what came true what has not come forecasting is a hazardous business i have indulged in part of it and i wish to conclude by saying that for me it was a very enjoyable experience with uh, professor kamar we often differed but we continued to be in very uh, very <laughs> good books of 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 each other because his ideas were very different from my my, my ideas of, of of chemical engineering even in 60s and and then of course he retired and all but please note all the soon after i joined him in june 19 um, um, 58 in december 58 he moved to iit so it was so i used to come to iit library uh, it was quite a journey to reach uh, iit from from vikruli station you know <laughs> and how iit ambience has changed so radically is something to see whole bombay is, is growing 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 all the time when i came to mutunga in 54 it was a very distant suburb now even chembur is not central bombay it will move on to washi in another 5 to 10 years ladies and gentlemen and my fellow speakers uh, i want to stick to my time time schedule i uh, once again i have enjoyed my association with iit i am also an alumnus of iit bombay because iit bombay was very gracious so got me time to confer honorary doctorate on me and i want to com compliment deepak himmat singha who worked so hard to create this endowment thank you thank you very much sir um, professor sharma is open to questions um, i request you to use the chat function if you have any questions for professor sharma i'll give a couple of minutes for the questions to come in so while uh, uh, we let audience couple of minutes for question uh, let me ask a question in between uh, uh, hello uh, professor sharma i am bharat uh, i recently joined uh, iit bombay in chemical engineering department i work on uh, electrochemical system and on which i have a question so the electrochemical engineering and the education that relates to electrochemical systems mm -hmm. i find them a bit lacking in uh, chemical engineering uh, curriculum uh, uh, mainly because it's uh, interdisciplinary and it has components of electrical perhaps some of its materials and chemical engineering 
So what can be done about uh, this particular uh, field in terms of education? I would say it is still within, predominantly within the domain of uh, chemical. Look at the series of books that came from California, Berkeley. They are the, uh, you know, encyclopedia of electrochemical. <coughs> Similarly, what came from ETH uh, in, uh, in Switzerland and one or two laboratories in, 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 in France. But the exciting part of this is if we can do anodic and cathodic reactions simultaneously. I was telling Ramesh the other day that electrolytic hydrogen is coming central state, but nobody is talking about the oxygen utilization in any sizable uh, way. If we can develop new methodologies of carrying out commercially oxidations uh, with that oxygen that is uh, coming, if not, at least other um, uses of oxygen, it will make the electrochemical processes. I want to assure you, tell you, there are already commercial processes where both anodic and cathodic reactions um, uh, are going on simultaneously for commercially important products. Now, try and design these electrochemical cells, the role cells. So many designs are there in the electrochemical. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very exciting area. Yeah, indeed it is. Uh, so I'm not able to see raised hands. Uh, Varun, are you able to see the hands raised? Um, I was uh, told Varad, that uh, Professor yeah. Suresh yeah, yeah. raised hand for a moment. Professor A.K. Suresh. Yeah. Can, yeah, you, yeah. Uh, can you please Even allow him to speak? Yeah. Uh, can you unmute all? Oh, yeah. this is Partha Sarathi. Yeah, please. This yeah. is Partha Sarathi. I was a student of NRK. It was a long, long ago, too many years ago. Uh, and a close friend of Dr. M.M. Um, one question on electrochemistry. I did work on electrochemistry actively in an industrial project about 30 years ago, where uh, we were trying uh, hydrogenation in an electrochemical cell. Of course, the problem we had, and we worked with the South Indian Institute, I don't wish to name the institute, which had supposedly developed a process. But then we had to do a lot of work over two years. So we set up our own pilot plant. Uh, the amount of, uh, what should I say, transition skills from R&D to industry has been relatively poor in India, at least until I stopped looking at it about eight to nine years ago. And in reference to what uh, Dr. M.M. said, about both the using both the electrodes, both the anode and the cathode, and doing both oxidation, hydrogenation. Uh, in my own area, for example, one of the products we make, uh, BASF has done a lot of good work and has industrialized processes, which are uh, supposed to be very good, where at both electrodes they get very good commercial processes. I'm talking about phthalide, the phthalic anhydride uh, reduction. So producing of phthalide and then potassium phthalide for pharmaceuticals. And at the other electrode, I don't remember exactly what they make. Methoxy, methoxytoline to anisic aldehyde. The yeah, anisic aldehyde, that too. And of course, the solvent also in some of these cases has been playing a part. You know? uh, thank you. But uh, there is work done, but there's too little work done in India on this. The big advantage is once you have perfected one cell, scale up is not a problem because you That's right. put multiples. That is the biggest advantage of electrochemical yeah. engineering. It's a battery. You're right. It's a battery of cells. You're right. Varun, apparently uh, that is disabled. So I think go with. Uh, Go with yeah. the raised hands probably one by one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. Daddy, Daddy Burger has some question. Um, well, uh, yes. I think Yogo, go with the raised hands. Well, can I speak? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, yeah. uh, I, I also put my question in the chat, so please uh, ignore that. I, I had a question uh, for uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, and I was recalling back when I visited you with, uh, in UDCT for a few months in 88, uh, I was uh, very impressed by the fact that you had a real concern uh, for lab safety, which was just beginning to be uh, of concern in the US uh, as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Sharma, can you comment on how 
uh, the practice of safety in the lab has uh, continued to improve since then. Thank you. Oh, so, uh, Professor Sharma, he has asked, uh, he is asking a question about lab safety and how it has improved over a period of time. Yes, in fact, uh, there is such a heavy emphasis now, you know, uh, we used to have malfunctioning in room cupboards even. Now, and how you keep cylinders outside in a bank, lab safety is the one which gives you uh, a lesson how you are going to um, uh, work for safety in the commercial plant. But that commercial plant is far more demanding, but the basic training starts in the institute, you know, that you follow the safety measures, whether you wear, see, we were all working without uh, uh, safety glasses and all, you know, without apron. And then you could see in the in our chemistry lab, H2S coming, you could easily smell in the lab. All those things are gone and just not acceptable. So the safety starts first at the level of education. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, in the interest of time, I think uh, we'll move ahead and go to the next speaker. So thank you very much, Professor Sharma, for that insightful talk. Um, I now invite Professor Benjamin to introduce the second speaker of the day, Dr. R. A. Mashilkar. Thank you, Varun. Dr. R. A. Mashilkar obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from UDCT, again now known as ICT, and PhD degree from the same institute in 1969. Dr. Mashelkar has made significant contributions in the field of transport phenomena, the field of polymers, polymerization reactors, and in the analysis of non-Newtonian flows. He was a visiting professor at Harvard University, University of Delaware, Technical University of Denmark, and he was also a distinguished professor at Monash University. I think many of us know that he served as the Director General of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR. This is, this is a network of labs um, in India. Now, prior to this, he was also the Director of National Chemical Lab in Pune for six years. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Mashilkar won several awards. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Mashilkar won several awards and some of the prestigious among them are the Padma Vibhushan Award, Star of Asia Award at the hands of George Bush Sr., who was the former US President, JRD Tata Corporate Leadership Award, which is an exclusive award given for Indian corporates, TWAS Lenovo Science Prize, which is the highest honor given by, by the third, by the World Academy of Science. Thank you, Varun. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now invite Dr. Mashelkar to deliver his address. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you see my presentation on the screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, very good. Uh, you know, it was wonderful. Guruji, I thought I was in a class. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, really, every time I hear you, there is something new. And this has gone on for, uh, from 1963, for 58 years. Each time I met him, I learned something new. So I'd like to begin by uh, dedicating this lecture to my great guru, Professor M.M. Sharma. And he taught me not just chemical engineering, but much, much more and continues to do so even today. I must also say something else. You know, I was uh, uh, president of uh, Institute of Chemical Engineers of UK and all the presidents were asked to write 
about uh, the best chemical engineer that they have ever met in life. You know, a couple of paragraphs and that they are going to print out. And I met thousands of them and I was privileged to write about Professor Sharma as the best chemical engineer I've ever met. So uh, Subhashis is not just guru, he is Adi guru. So I start with the you know, normal tradition of uh, uh, doing a pranam to my guru and uh, uh, give my thoughts to you. So we are looking at uh, the future and it's very good that we are looking at the future. It's good to think about the past, but as someone else has said that I only think of the future because that is where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. So let's talk about the future. So what are going to be the Gen next chemical engineers? I have five thoughts on that. I mean, the, uh, in terms of uh, the future. First of all, they will have to be borderless and uh, Prince Sharma sort of brought that out uh, very clearly. Secondly, they have to be integrative engineers and I'll explain what I mean by that. Third, solution engineers. You know, I've been on this Queen Elizabeth Prize of Engineering, a million pound prize, which is considered as a Nobel Prize in Engineering. And when I got inducted there, they asked me, what is the future of uh, engineers? And I remember telling them, forget about chemical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, all that matters is solution engineer. Given a challenge, whether it's an artificial heart or a bridge, how do you create a sort of solution? So that is going to be very critical. Inclusive engineers, the social responsibilities uh, are very, very critical. The world's inequalities are rising dramatically. And therefore, uh, we have to take care of the have nots And finally, responsible engineers. And I'll explain what I mean by that. The first part of it, borderless chemical engineering. Um, I remember the, giving the ninth uh, PV Rankworth Memorial Lecture 1994, which is 27 years ago. And the title of that was Seamless Chemical Engineering Science, the Emerging Paradigm, how the boundaries between engineering and science are actually uh, vanishing. And I uh, have actually practiced it, it was mentioned that I've been a visiting professor at Harvard and uh, it's incredible the way, uh, for example, the integration and borderlessness takes place. This is a paper that we produced in PNAS uh, 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 this was on a report on nanoparticle that monitors his anti-cancer efficacy in real uh, uh, time. And if you see, actually we describe a biology inspired engineering in one report on nanoparticle that not only delivers cytotoxic uh, payload to the tumor, but also reports back the efficacy. And the report on nanoparticle was engineered from a novel two-stage stimulus responsive polymeric material, something that I have worked uh, sort of all my life. So this was a confluence of several disciplines that were brought together. And if you just really see, I remember uh, when I was studying in UDCT and now ICT, uh, this is where we are all focused on, chemical reactors, process units, and so on. But as you can quite clearly see now, the uh, range of areas in which uh, chemical engineers work extends from nanometer to micron to millimeter to meter uh, to kilometers. It is an unbelievable scale that uh, chemical engineers uh, uh, cover today. It is uh, really incredible. Now, if you see, I mean, <laughs> when we're looking at coronavirus, for example, virology, will chemical engineers have a role to play? And you can see this paper in ASCHE on chemical engineering and virology, and also immunology, the complexity in the immune systems, and there are new opportunities. So there is no field that will be sort of uh, untouched as far as chemical. It's the most versatile branch of engineering, I would say. I remember John Bridgewater, as you know, he was the former editor of Chemical Science and chairman of the chemical engineering department. He just passed away a month ago. And I remember I was invited to speak in his uh, seminar and I had talked about uh, what is called as phytochemical engineering, the plants, for example. Can we create designer plants? Uh, optimizing composition is distribution, control of growth, pharmacodynamics in the case of multi-component mixtures, understanding uh, absorption, transport, permeation, etc. Now, designer plants might look like uh, sort of a fancy, but uh, that is uh, true. I mean, we are talking about vaccines, but uh, if you see the startup uh, Mapbio. Uh, they had created these antibody therapeutics from bioengineered plants uh, for Ebola virus. You know, there was a specific uh, tobacco species. So this is going to be a ground reality. And of course, designing new uh, sort of systems. I was very happy to see that after a few months after I had talked about it, 
There's a major paper by Jacqueline Shanks on phytochemical engineering that appeared combining chemical reaction engineering with plant science. Professor Sharma talked very eloquently about the catalysis and he's absolutely right. But if you see the historical development, for example, uh, previously we had the heroic chemistry where selectivity will be low, the plant cost will be high, the catalyst sophistication uh, will be low and simple molecules will be produced. And from there, we have made this continuous progress, uh, uh, Ziegler Nata, shape selective, and the future catalyst will be natural enzymes, enzymes, and there the molecules produced will be complex, the catalyst sophistication will be high, the plant cost will be low, and the process selectivity will be high. So this journey is a very interesting one, and that cannot take place unless there is a transdisciplinarity. And I can show it from our own experience. For example, if you see life science and material science, uh, these are the four pillars, right? all right? Molecular recognition, functional organization, or mobility. And then you talk about uh, functional supramolecular systems, for example, which we see. But can you do them synthetically? And we did that. Uh, it was the genius of uh, uh, M.G. Kulkarni from my group and Karmal Karad, my PhD student. And we looked at uh, switching biomimetic uh, gelzymes. We had heard about geozymes, but gelzymes. And this was to do with on off regulation of enzymatic reactions, you know? How can you control them? How can you turn uh, a catalyst on and off, on and off, on and off by just a stimuli? So there were two ways of doing it. One was the activity of catalytic site you can change, or the probability of substrate itself reaching uh, the active site uh, you can change, all right? This is more diffusion limited. And uh, uh, we actually had the strategy. We took chymotrypsin, for example. And in the natural chymotrypsin, the functional groups are brought together by chain folding, and they are governed by sequence distribution of amino acids. But in the mimic that we created, we polymerized uh, the macromolecular structure comprising the structure formed by the monomers. The functional groups are the most important one. And the template uh, we created in the presence of a cross link. So the active sites are important. They have to come in a particular configuration. The hydroxyl group, the carboxyl group, and the imidazole group. And they came from serine 195, aspartic acid 102, and histidine 57, of course. And this is the strategy that we actually uh, sort of adopted. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, hexaethyl uh, methacrylate, uh, methacrylic acid, MA histidine, then cobalt, then created a complex. And then uh, with an initiator, uh, the uh, AIBM, and then a photochromatic monopor as a cross-linker, uh, we created this and uh, took out the imprinted uh, the sort of cavity. And you can see, this was a paper that we produced in Procedure of Royal Society, by the way, it was highly appreciated. And you can see by using two stimuli, one uh, for the active site uh, 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 change in terms of uh, being on and off, you can see how we can, by changing, uh, I mean, turning the UV on and off, we could create a, a switching biomimetic hydrogen. And the other case was uh, where by changing pH, uh, we created a switch, so as to say. I think the central point I tried to make is that there are six different fields which are brought together in order to make this possible. If you look at, so I've talked about borderless. Let's just talk about the integrative uh, uh, engineers. Now, integrative chemical engineers, they will integrate disciplines, like I said. They will uh, integrate geography. They will integrate industries. Like, for example, the, uh, the same industrial enterprise dealing with materials, uh, dealing with uh, agriculture products, dealing with fuel, dealing with uh, energy, and so on and so forth. Markets, customers. Now, if you look at uh, advanced biorefineries, that means I'm not uh, talking about hydrocarbons, but carbohydrate. Uh, based uh, plants, then there will have to be creative integration in terms of plant genetics, biochemistry, biotechnology, biomass conversion chemistry, process engineering, separation technology, and now, of course, this is synthetic biology. Similarly, uh, the creative integration, the second part is, uh, uh, like I said, fuels and energy, chemicals and materials, agriculture, agro-marketing, food chain, and so on. So new chemical engineers will have be uh, sort of integrative. And of course, as Professor Sharma also said, mentioned about AI and other things, uh, digital technologies. In fact, 
digitalization, decentralization, and decarbonization are going to be the keys. And as you can see in the industry 4.0, there will be chemical industry 4.0, where uh, digitalization and integration of vertical and horizontal uh, value chains, the service offerings, et cetera, they will all get integrated. And these new advances that are taking place, whether it was augmented reality or cloud computing, mobile devices, IoT platforms, 3D printing, sensors, et cetera, they will all get integrated. So the second part is really integrated. The third part is solution engineers, all right? And as I said, no matter what problem you are given, chemical engineers uh, will have to, what I like to call as connect the dots, basically, and particularly seemingly unconnected. And uh, if you look at uh, the mind of an engineer, you know, what is the core engineering mind? Making things that work is the first thing and making things work better. These are two things, as simple as that. And then if you look at the engineering habits of mind, you know, improving system thinking, adapting, problem finding, visualizing. And among the most important thing there is open-mindedness. You know, they say parachute works only when it is open. Mind is also like that. It works when it is open. And a brilliant example of that, you know, the Lenovo Science Prize was mentioned. And in that, I talked about some of our work, uh, trapeze artistry in biomimetic uh, smart gels. And there we were working on gels for a number of uh, years for different reasons, but we looked at the science of gels. And uh, there is always a joy in doing something for the first time coming from India. You know, there's no point in just following, leading is very important. And I remember as far as gels are concerned, the sensitivity, shape, memory, and mobility, they were demonstrated. But I'm proud to say that from the NCL laboratory, we showed self-organization for the first time, self-healing for the first time, enzyme-like activity that I showed a little earlier uh, for the first time. Uh, what was the safe organization? This was, uh, you know, these uh, swearing gels, for example, if you have a sphere, you get a bigger sphere and you can collapse it depending upon the stimuli. If you have a cylinder, you get a bigger cylinder. In fact, uh, we were able to demonstrate that this was purely serendipity, accident, um, by soon Shiny Burgess found it. And uh, uh, that was that you take a cylinder, and put it in a copper chloride solution, um, an aqueous solution, and you find that uh, that cylinder turns into a sphere. And not only a sphere, but a hollow sphere. And this was the first uh, self-organization because cytospores are known at the level of 100 nanometers, coconut at 10 centimeter. But this was the first uh, the sort of macroscopic self-organization that we actually could uh, uh, sort of show. And this was done with a magic, uh, uh, gel of uh, acryl and 6 amino caproic acid, by the way. And you can see the healing. This is a Proceedings of National Academy of Science paper that we wrote. Uh, Ashish Lele, Shiny Varghese, myself, and a uh, couple of others. And you can quite clearly see how quickly they are able to uh, sort of heal within just a few seconds. We were the first ones to show such uh, rapid cell healing. But the interesting part of it was that not everything will heal. When we were designing these copolymers, depending upon the methylene side chains, for example, uh, if it was one, it did not heal. If it was 10, it did not heal. But there's an optimum balance of five where it uh, uh, actually worked. So this is why we have called it trapeze artistry. And how do you balance the hydrophilicity? In fact, this, is a, this slide is a one of our lecture, by the way, I can't uh, give that. But what I want to show is that how that ACCSEA, which was born out of an accident in NCL, provided solutions in completely unrelated areas, like stem cell engineering, like biomineralization, like entering implants, like oil well drilling. Uh, you can see here, for example, the uh, in stem cell engineering, how the cells are there and spread best on ACCSEA compared to uh, all others, uh, promoting cell adhesion, migration, and so on and so forth. You can quite clearly uh, see it here. Uh, C5 would mean uh, uh, five methylene groups, A6, uh, ACM. Similarly, for example, biomineralization, we were able to sort of uh, uh, demonstrate it, how uh, it occurs the best when it is A6, ACA. And uh, then uh, this elastic entry implants, you know, Bob Langer, uh, with, uh, uh, who got the uh, Nobel Prize equivalent of engineering, uh, one of the most celebrated engineer, for example, they had this elastic entering implants uh, challenge. And the challenge was 
that when you have the gastric retentive device, uh, uh, they must have facial delivery, you know, and they must uh, 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 live there for a long time in, uh, in terms of the gastric retention. Safety profile must be sort of complete. And uh, the existing enteric polymeric gels uh, were rigid and brittle and no device for combining enteric plus elastic properties to deliver critical performance. That was a challenge. And they found a solution by using A6ACA, uh, creating pH responsive supramolecular gel, you know, which was stable in acidic conditions and dissolvable in alkaline condition. That means in the uh, intestine. In fact, their paper says that although there have been extensive studies and commercial examples, this uh, manuscript presents the first demonstration of both extremely prolonged gastric retention and safe gastrointestinal passage with the help of the innovative combination. So I think the simple point I'm trying to make about solution engineering is how do you connect the unconnected? And the last one, of course, was in oil well uh, drilling, Halliburton sort of doing it. And the crux of the invention was that they introduced a suspension of uh, this hydrogel in wells in the high pH. And upon lowering the pH, instant agglomeration takes place. For example, you can see here high pH, uh, they're segregated, low pH, uh, they come together. So plugging uh, becomes uh, uh, easy. Now, you can just see how in a completely unrelated fields you could find solutions by this lateral thinking. So the fourth one is inclusion engineers. And uh, the, uh, 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 interestingly, uh, when people think about engineers, uh, they had uh, actually done an opinion poll in the next 20 years, uh, what people will feel engineering can achieve. And of course, improve renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera, were the highest. And the lowest was address social inequality. I completely disagree with this. This has to be at the top of the ladder because social inequality is going to be the greatest challenge that we are going to have. In fact, I remember uh, giving this talk on Gandhian engineering, getting more from less for more people in, the, in Australia, in Canberra, uh, that uh, became very popular. The Sikhe Prahlad and I wrote this paper, which is now ranked among the top 10 master read paper. And we showed here that, uh, and the, in fact, it became so uh, popular that within six months, World Economic Forum had a session on that. And the idea there was on creating an affordable excellence, getting more from less for more people, all right? Because normally, getting more for more is very easy. You put in a lot of money and you create um, uh, uh, sort of high technology products, sophisticated. Getting less from less is very easy, okay? Low technology for the poor. But getting more from less for more and more people is the challenge. And I remember when I was the president of IKEMI, we actually created a 10,000 points, uh, pounds uh, Dirbai Ambani Award for outstanding inclusive chemical engineering, uh, which looks at creating such products for the poor. Now, well, but the point we are trying to make is very frankly that if you want to create an artificial food, of course you can do $12,000 uh, food, but how many can afford it? What wins is a $28 food, the Jaipur food, which became the headline. In fact, I have a, a sort of a film, which I'll not show for want of time, where this uh, uh, young man uh, that you see here actually runs a kilometer in four minutes, 30 seconds. You know, that is absolutely incredible. And generally I ask a question, how many of you can do one kilometer in four minutes, 30 seconds? Hardly a hand goes up. 1% of the people raise their hand. That means he's able to beat 99. So therefore, if he was given, uh, let us say the 12,000 foot, he could not afford, so you would have been crawling. If he was given a wooden foot, he would have been crawling. But with this foot, he was able to run one kilometer foot. So that is the affordable excellence that we must leave. And inclusive chemical engineering for an inclusive world is something that we have to work hard on. And the last point I'll come to, and that has to do with responsible engineers. Responsible, first of all, for our own industry. All right, we cannot let accidents uh, happen. We cannot let... Uh, uh, people die as a result of uh, those accidents. You know, unfortunately, the two worst uh, accidents that happened in India in chemical industry, I was involved with both, not in causing them, but in trying to find out what happened. It was, of course, uh, the Bhopal disaster. Uh, I remember I was on the accident tank within two days. Uh, I was the technical assessor for the inquiry commission. And the other one was Maharashtra gas Kakar complex, uh, where 34 deaths uh, took place. And in both cases, they were human errors. We cannot afford to have such accidents uh, uh, at all. 
but most importantly the issue is our being responsible for the whole world as president of insa i remember uh, chairing this uh, lecture by lord martin this was the president of royal society and you know what was the talk his title was will the civilization survive the 21st century you know we came out sweating and what was his worry his worry was the climate change which prof sharma mentioned the global warming stratospheric uh, ozone layer depletion ravaging of biodiversity and so on and so forth so this responsible chemical engineering must become responsible for solving these problems i'm very happy that uh, uh, by uh, uh, university has produced uh, this responsible chemical engineer mukesh ambani and uh, you must have seen he has announced this uh, 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 green uh, energy uh, new energy uh, green hydrogen for example and he has given that 111 rl aspiration uh, his plans are to invest 10 billion dollars within the next 3 uh, years he announced that uh, last agm then this year he announced the uh, investment that he is doing also there is a new energy council that has been created uh, and the chairman of the council we started work in uh, march and some of the who's who are there giving us a sort of a path and i think this is uh, extraordinarily important that green energy i mean green hydrogen we are talking about 111 1 kg per 1 uh, uh, kg of hydrogen in one decade that is aspirational uh, but i'm sure just like what they did in jo you know for rupees per uh, gb the cheapest and the pre uh, voice call and so on and so forth uh, we are at it now uh, i must also say that we must back it up by technology for example can't help for showing this slide for example csr is building for the hydrogen economy in uh, everything hydrogen generation hydrogen storage hydrogen utilization and we are quite capable of doing it uh, professor sharma was uh, gave us the guide uh, guidance on the our new millennium indian technology leadership initiative this development of 3 kw pfmc system has been created uh, the first uh, fuel cell based car and then of course uh, you see uh this uh, demonstration of high temperature pfmc etc the main point is how does it get finally into the market that's uh, that's the basic issue and there i must say that uh, technology and policy must go together like for example uh if you uh, uh, sort of go back i think i will skip that slide uh, 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 the public policy for example in terms of uh, 600000 towers basically getting Uh, uh changed uh, not diesel generating uh, uh you know particulate guzzling towers but with fuel cell if you can do 8 november 8 o'clock uh demonetization why can't this be done uh, the uh, sort of overnight we can sort of change the point i want to make finally is that we have to take responsibility for challenges of the 21st century like identifying viable alternative sources of energy uh, food security promoting green engineering boosting inclusive growth uh, that i mentioned about little earlier as well as addressing climate change uh, through science engineering innovation health for all rethinking how our urban cities will look and work and as i said digitalization decentralization decarbonization so my friends there are those five points that i have uh, sort of uh, talked about as far as engineering is concerned finally i like to end by uh, recalling what the ieee lamy medal says the engineer views hopefully the hither to an attainable i would like to modify it by saying the chemical engineer is the one who will view hopefully the hither to unattainable thank you thank you very much thank you sir for that inspiring talk um there seems to be some issue with the chat so i request the participants to raise your hands if you have any question for dr mashirtha in the interest of time we'll be taking up a maximum of three questions um i also request professor suthar to take up questions uh, from the audience thank you uh hi uh so i think we have a first question from uh, joy shah joy shah can you uh, mention your question please yeah uh, thank you dr marshall kar as usual your talk is very inspiring uh, my question is now all of us are looking for energy transi- transition and reliance is going ahead with a lot of uh, energy for the energy transition 111 and all those things and world over lot of development and rnd is taking place for the hydrogen economy and here we are starting that rnd in india with the basics 
so why don't we uh, uh, get these tap on on whatever has been invented or found out in the world and being practiced by the rest of the people and let us go for the additional r and d and then uh, then uh, work out some option because if we go by the basic r and d the way we are doing like searching for this storage and all those things perhaps a lot of effort has been, has gone in and uh, and uh, Uh, perhaps we have to adopt it and then work on it. What is your view on that? And perhaps I I wish that it sh we should step on whatever is available in the world. I'll tell you my. Uh, you have to go back to my paper called Economics of Knowledge. That was my C D Deshmukh Memorial Lecture given in nineteen ninety eight. And that paper actually gives five strategies. These are the following. The first is buy. okay when somebody is willing to give you a technology and you can't always buy it for example even acrylic acid for rome rome and us we were we were begging we didn't get it butyl rubber with great difficulty up to 40 years we managed to get uh, something so technologies are not available for lower for money that's one the buy the second is make we must make uh, a, a, a sort of our own because you can be screwed any time basically you know i remember uh, uh, i was uh, the dg when we had this 14 seater aircraft completely indigenous but one part out of 1500 uh, sorry 15000 in the uh, in that aircraft was not uh, uh, was under entities list and our project got delayed by 18 months okay so there is no substitute to that that's the second part so one is buy one second is make the third is buy to make better for example japan they were not the originators of transistors all right they bought the patents and sony became the best okay so when we talk about trl technology readiness uh, level you know you will not always be at trl 9 level you can get one at 4 or 5 and then raise it to 9 the fourth one is make to buy better what does make to buy better mean if you have a, a, a sort of a readiness of a particular technology you have a leverage all right like for example india supercomputers they were completely denied craig smp 1205 i mean we were not getting that at all then uh, uh, our uh, uh, vijay bhatkar created param 8000 then param 10000 and after param 10000 was then the same craig company came by the way all right so that's a leverage as dr kalam used to say only strength is respect strength you extend your hand they will shake hand with you if you are strong and i'll give you a personal example professor sharma will be familiar with it i was on the ipcl board and we required alpha olefin technology why did we require alpha olefin to make alpha olefin sulfonate why alpha olefin sulfonate detergents okay is there any strategic thing in uh, close washing nothing we did not get it we went to edomitsu we went to chevron we went to shell we did not get it and then we started work and the genius of sivram basically created a, 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 a sort of a, we went up to pilot plant it was stopped by, by some finance guy and i remember one of these three companies i will not mention who they were traveling with me and they said had you gone up to pilot plant we would have given you the technology because they would have been threatened so there is what is called as preparedness okay and the technology that i showed to you by the way including the pmfc it is ahead of ballard by the way there are 25 patents out of which 15 are in the us all right and there have been breakthrough technology in terms of both performance and promise so we are not copying i'm not a great believer in copying it all new millennium indian technology leadership initiative is leadership please understand that okay and the last part of it is making it together all right and those partnership can be local uh, basically as well as uh, Uh, uh universal and uh, in fact i will refer you to a paper that i written how uh, we can create uh, science and technology which is globally competitive where have given um, uh, instances of uh, uh, where we are i think the major point is the technology and policy must go together so as to say the trust must be there you know and uh, the, uh, i'm sorry to be labor on that point but i will just take one more minute to explain to you in my mother's name i have created what is called as anjani marshalkar inclusive innovation award simple one lakh small one 
and i don't give it to the uh, best practice i give it to the next practice i'm not a great believer in best practice by the way not copying not even copying so one of that award went to navin khanna we had done this uh, um, uh, you know dengue i hope none of you had dengue but if you had got dengue your taste will come after one or two days he created something which was within 15 minutes he could spot and at what level do you know something nobody would take it we were importing from australia from south korea and from us okay then what happened and he had us patents on it uh, fda clearance everything nobody would buy it then what happened was that we had a pandemic and we ran out basically when we ran out um, uh, then uh, we went to the, all these three countries begging and two of them said no only south korea said yes and then we ordered and those dengue kits were loaded on the wrong ship which went to africa so we were left with nothing and then we had no option but to come to navin khan and today from that 0% market share yes 78% market share so it is talent technology and trust we have all the talent in the world we have the technology it's a question of trust all right and i feel strongly about it uh, the, the, you know that's what we need to do okay so this is a thank you very much it is not this or that thank you very much uh, very very clear now make to buy better yeah yes thank no you. five buy make make to buy better buy to make better and make it together make it and together. depending upon the state of technology and state of the nation people adopt different things by the way nobody does uh, one of them we have to be smart sure thank you very much okay so let's take one more question before we move on uh, shivram kumar uh, are you there yeah uh, good evening everybody uh, this is sivram uh, so th thank you so much respect us uh, 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 my question is effective waste management leading to a good health management and these two to put together could it create a responsible wealth management uh, i mean uh, are you uh, uh, talking this as a gandhian engineering is this uh, uh, but yeah a non utopian possibility sir thank you very much well my my definition of gandhi engineering was uh, very different by the way what i was looking at were well, looking at two principles of uh, mahatma gandhi the first was uh, 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 there is enough for everyone need but not for everyone's greed that means get more from less that means preserve the resources and get more and more of them so that uh, uh, your future generations will have and the other one was uh, that the benefits of science must reach uh, all the poor uh, that means for more and more people that that is how it became more from less uh, for uh, 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 more so that was that was my philosophy so uh, i'm not relating it to uh, any of the specific sectors etc the idea is to give affordable excellence all right uh, in everything that we do and uh, more uh, holistically we think about this uh, problem not just looking at uh, technological innovation but also business model innovation system delivery innovation workflow innovation organization you know, combining them basically and then the, it is uh, sector uh, sort of neutral so as to say in all sectors that we talk okay thank you sir yeah maybe we can take one more question um parimal parikh yes good evening sir good evening uh, i am i am professor parimal parikh and i am surat i have one small question in india have we identified the sites for co2 sequestration and what uh, pipelines for co2 transportation to those sites what is the status please well uh, i uh, was talking to an expert i am not an expert in this area but uh, as far as we are concerned uh, Uh, i understand from the experts that in terms of uh, sequestrations will be poorly off in terms of uh, the geological formations uh, uh, the savanna aquifers and this that and the other etc uh, we will not have the kind of advantage that the other nations have then what can be done sir if we collect co2 from industries or power stations hmm. uh, what can be done with that 
No, no, of course. Uh, b- b- we already, uh, already uh, talked about uh, several ways of uh, valorization of carbon dioxide. I mean, there are new chemistries that are uh, coming up now. Uh, basically, we have to uh, push the accelerator button and sort of uh, move on with uh, There are, uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you send me your email ID, I will send you references to those emerging technologies. No issue on that. Thank you, Sampli. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Mashirkar. I, I would like to hear from Dr. Professor Sharma. He has raised his hand. I don't know. Arvind Kumar, I don't know. Uh, I, I think we'll move ahead. Um, we're oh, sort of... I think this is Anand Kusre. Can I just have a few seconds? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure, sir. Yeah, it's always great to have Dr. Vishalka, of course, Dr. Sharma also. Hey, Anand, and wonderful to see you. <laughs> wonderful to see you always. Yeah. I just want to mention that not only what framework uh, Professor Vishalka has given just now on the five points, it is not just a new framework while general, general gen next is coming. It has been in implementation for almost quarter century by Dr. Mishakar himself. And he mentioned about the Nimitli program. And I would like to mention that uh, today there are only three countries in the world who are making vaccines for the coronavirus. And of course, India has got those them. And not only the framework, but actual programs to execute them and implement them. The program that we had... Uh, and it is through that program that Shanta Biotechnics and Bharat Biotech have come with the help of CCMB and the SPRAID program that today we have got these vaccines ready at this time. So I would request Dr. Marshalkar to really, I think, highlight that. And it's take time, but you have to take action much earlier to be ready for that, Dr. Marshalkar. I totally agree. And that is why I was a bit aggressive while answering. Anybody who asked me why, what they were done, uh, why do you have to do that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, my reaction is always an angry reaction because this is absolutely wrong. You know, in terms of security of the country, this is absolutely wrong. So please take that out because we had we not done the Nimitli at that time and funded uh, uh, Krishna Raju and uh, 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 Krishna Ella and others, etc., you know. Yeah. We would not be where we are today. All right. We could have always said, yeah, go vaccine. Please change your mindset. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Mashalkar. Hello. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Mashalkar. Uh, I now invite Professor Benjamu to introduce the last speaker of the day, Professor Devan Kakkar. Thank you, Varun. Professor Devan Kakkar obtained his uh, BTEC degree in chemical engineering from IIT Delhi and PhD degree from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the USA. He joined the Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Bombay in 1987. He rose through the ranks, became professor, head, dean of faculty affairs, and he was appointed as the director of IIT Bombay and served the institute in this capacity for two terms. And under his directorship, IIT Bombay expanded significantly in terms of number of students, number of faculty, and also the research intensity. It's built stronger links with industry and international peer universities. And it is also among the top uh, educational institutes in India. A highlight of his tenure was the establishment and growth of a the joint book. PhD program with Monash University. Professor Devan Kakkar's research interests include mechanics of granular materials and polymer processing. He received several awards, including the Swarna Jayanti Fellowship, SS Bhatnagar Prize, and J.C. Bose Fellowship. He's also a recipient of IIT Bombay's Excellence in Teaching Award and IIT Bombay's Mathur Award for Research Excellence. He's a fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering and also Indian National Science Academy. And he serves on the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board of India. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I now invite Professor Kakkar to deliver his address. 
So good evening. Uh, I just share my screen. So uh, it's really a very great honor for me to be part of this function. And it's really a privilege to follow two giants uh, of the chemical engineering and even the scientific discipline uh, and try and follow after their most brilliant talks. Uh, I must say that both, I've had a very close association with both Professor Sharma and uh, Dr. Marshalkar. They have been great mentors to me. They have been uh, great uh, supporters and I have really gained a lot through my association with them. And in fact, uh, the Institute also, when I was director for 10 years, received their support throughout. And uh, Dr. Mashelkar, of course, played a very important role as chair of the IIT Bombay Monash uh, Research Academy Advisory Committee. And that was one of the very important programs that flourished in those years. You know, we have already seen a, an amazing picture of this our discipline. And, you know, if any of you had any doubts of how exciting it is to be a chemical engineer, I'm sure all those doubts would be removed. You know, the future is just amazing. And, uh, you know, the opportunities are incredible. And it's not just about, you know, if you see what Professor Sharma said, what Professor Mashelkar said, it's not just about, uh, you know, building chemical factories. It is really a, has a huge scope and it can have a huge impact, including a social impact. Uh, you know, I thought that I would focus in a very uh, small way on a small part of what they were talking about and try and share my own experience on how computation is becoming more and more important in our profession. And uh, let me start, first of all, of course, by paying my respects to Professor N.R. Kamath. Uh, this is a photograph of his, and it seems to be one of the only photographs that uh, we come across. Most of the time we see this photograph. Uh, he was founding head of chemical engineering at IIT Bombay. And in fact, you know, the whole department was shaped by him because he served as head for 15 years from 1959 to 1974. I joined in 1987, long after he had retired, but his legacy was very apparent. Uh, one of the very distinct features of our department was that there were many technology oriented labs like silicate technology, pulp and paper technology and so forth. And then there was another set of unit operations lab. And many faculty members would work together in each lab. And so that legacy has sort of continued and our department still has many shared labs with many faculty working together. I'm happy to say that, uh, of course, over time, you know, the focus of these labs has changed, but I have been in the fluid mechanics lab, which has essentially maintained its name and its focus uh, probably since his time. Another way that I experienced his legacy was through alumni. Many of the senior alumni uh, who were taught by him were full of admiration of him as his teacher, as a teacher, and many have written long essays on you know all their experiences on how he helped them and how he influenced them, and he has been a really major figure for many generations of students who graduated from our institute. And I'm really happy that we have the NR Kamath uh, chair professorship in his honor. And of course, you know, many students know his name because of the iconic NR Kamath Memorial Chemical Engineering Quiz Competition, which is held in Mumbai. And, you know, all the chemical engineering departments in the city participate. That has been going on for many, many years. And uh, I think that is also a very nice tribute to his memory. Let me show you another photograph of his, uh, which probably was taken uh, when some 
visitor was there at the institute and just for our colleagues and those who remember uh, this professor ragunathan uh, professor murthy professor mahajan professor narsimha murthy and of course professor nr kamat here and professor samir sarkar of course many of them are no more and uh, Uh, professor ragunathan was of course a very prominent professor many of us interacted very close to him professor mahajan was in the fluid mechanics laboratory and professor gsr narsimha murthy was the first person in the fluid mechanics he was senior most professor of the fluid mechanics laboratory i knew both of them well and professor samir sarkar uh, was in the uh, fuels and combustion laboratory and uh, you know they were all very uh, prominent in our department and many of our senior colleagues will remember them uh, but you know they have both a legacy professor ragunathan's daughter is an alumnus of iit bombay and she is now a, a scientist at the national chemical laboratory dr mashelkar you may of course remember her and uh, samir sarkar's son sutanu has also gone into the teaching profession and he teaches at the university of he is also an alumnus of iit bombay and he teaches at uh, uh, ucsd university of california at san, at san diego so just to remember those time <coughs> today i thought very briefly i'll talk about you know what has really changed in this uh, role of computation in our discipline and both from the point of view of research and education and i just like to give a few examples based on my own experience so when i was a student uh, doing my phd uh, one of the famous chemical engineers of that time professor eli scriven who was at the university of minnesota came and gave a seminar this was in 1983 and the minnesota supercomputer center had just been set up and he gave a very strong talk and he said it's time is come now to stop making approximations and we have to start solving problems using com computers he says no more approximate this to be a sphere or approximate that to be a slab he says use actual geometries take all physics and chemistry into account and you know it was a real eye opener eye opening uh, sort of seminar but the reality was that supercomputers were very expensive and accessible only to a very few to only very few researchers in fact most undergraduate students would never get access the second big hurdle was that software had to be written from scratch if you wanted to solve a significant problem that was almost like a phd level research so every major problem would take you know years for the software to be written before it could be solved and so of course there was a lot of impact of computers on research but you know on education this large scale computing had a very small impact this was 1983 now we are almost 40 years hence things have changed completely the reality now is that very powerful computers are available at low cost even laptops have multi core cpus and we can of course if you want to solve a big problem you can just purchase computing time on the cloud at a relatively low cost so this is one thing that hardware has become very affordable and the second is that there is open source software which is free and very powerful which is available and what this means is that significant problems can be solved with the resources available and students need to learn how to use these resources and you know somehow i've been trying to uh, get this message across <coughs> so let me just give a few examples on you know in some sense how computations give a much deeper insight than just uh, experiments so one of the areas that i have been working on a lot is on how to you know handle granular materials or particulate systems which are which is a very important problem in industry and over the years we have been doing very detailed experiments for example supposing you have particles in a rotating cylinder then can you see what is the motion and we used image analysis and so forth to make very very accurate measurements of all these quantities 
and then calculate all sorts of uh, parameters that are relevant for the system and then get you know the effect of various parameters on the profiles and so forth so but you know what were the problems that we faced well you know in the kind of system that we are looking at the biggest problem is that you know you can't see through the particle so making measurements is really difficult inside of course now there is mri there is x rays and so forth but it's difficult and so side wall is where we make most of our measurements it's really difficult to measure stresses so what is the force acting on a particle very difficult to measure and then of course you know if you are dealing in systems with walls then how do the walls affect all the system, what you are trying to measure so you can get out of this using computations and uh, one of the methods that is becoming very common and you know it is <coughs> widely used is to try and use something that is like molecular dynamics in which you track the motion of every particle using newton's equations and you know we developed a code in house to do this when the software was not that easily available and you know we could typically solve you know, say let's say for example this is how some uh, dumbbell shaped particles are flowing and so forth so we can calculate in detail you know everything uh, about this what are the forces what is the velocities and so forth and you know that gives a very detailed insight into what is going on but over time uh, what has happened you know you can do all sorts of things but over time what has happened is that now there is open source software and the one that is most relevant for what the problem that i talked about is this thing called lamps uh, it's large scale atomic molecular massively parallel simulator now this is software that is so powerful uh, but it's available for free and you know you can download it you can there are manuals you know it's this is a, just a snap of their website and so you have this really powerful software you know available to you and uh, let's say if you had to write a script to do the kind of simulation i just showed you it doesn't take much it just takes maybe a few commands which like this which i have written and this is just giving instructions to the software of what system you want to study you know and what other kind of measurements that you would like to make and so forth so just a few 10 or 20 lines in half an hour you can write a script and get going and you know this is just an example of uh, you know using this for uh, something like this and uh, in this problem we are using gravity in the radial direction we are using frictionless wall these kinds of things can never be done in experiment and the reason we are doing it is because there's an exact theory for these conditions and so now we can do the simulations and then compare it to the theory but there's no way that or you know, it's extremely difficult to generate gravity type of force in the radial direction that is acting in this direction and to have systems where the wall friction is zero you can also do various other kinds of calculations which would be really difficult to do experimentally so you know you have this shear flow or inclined plane flow like i showed you and you can actually calculate that you know how much of the momentum transfer is happening through collisions and how much of the momentum transfer is happening through interparticle friction now this type of detailed analysis can be done by computations but extremely difficult to do uh by uh using something like experiments this is a third example again using lamp so it's not just for particles but you can use molecules and we have been looking at uh stretching of pvdf professor sharma mentioned this polymer and it is very interesting it can uh, you know has very interesting properties including piezoelectric properties and by using very accurate force fields for this we can actually calculate things like free energy change uh, for you know the structure of this polymer to change from something like this to something like this <coughs> and you know the, though it sort of looks very similar 
the main thing to notice is all the red dots on the top and the blue dots are at the bottom. So, and this gives it some very special properties, including piezoelectric properties. So, this software is extremely powerful. And my message as far as using computations in research is concerned is that very detailed analysis is possible with measurements that are very difficult or impossible to do by measurements. You can vary all parameters independently. For example, I could take uh, friction that is equal to zero, which is very difficult to do by experiments. And you can get many new insights. But of course, we have to keep in mind that whenever we do these computations, we have to validate through experiments. Computations also have a big role to play in chemical engineering education. And uh, I have been teaching one course which is related to granular mechanics, which is a postgraduate elective and open to undergraduate students in which I give an introduction to the software lamps, which I've been talking about. And the students are required to do homework assignment as well as a project based on this software. And, you know, typical project topics could be something like flow due to gravity in an inclined channel and so forth. So, you know, really simple problems, but it gives students a way to actually uh, get a hands-on experience on what is going on. I also teach uh, fluid mechanics, which is a second year undergraduate core course. And here I introduce the students to another open source software called OpenFoam and another software called GMesh. Together, these are very useful for doing computational fluid dynamics. This is a subject that Professor Sharma said was extremely important in today's chemical engineering <coughs> practice. And here also students will do homework assignment and projects based on this. So this open form is really a very, very impressive thing where you can do CFD for both laminar or turbulent systems. And you know, it's completely free. You can simply, you know, download and install on any kind of system that you have, whether it's Windows or Linux or Mac, whatever it is, and it's download and install. And there's another software called GMesh, which is really for generating the geometry and the mesh. And, uh, you know, this is their website. And in a very short time, you can generate, for example, a mesh like this, which is a mesh for uh, an array of cylinders. And so, you know, you can have this. So once you generate the mesh, you can put this mesh into open form and get the full velocity field. So this would be uh, what the flow field would be like for flow past a bank of cylinders. So it's a, a real problem. It's in turbulent conditions using turbulent models and so forth. And you can get really quite realistic answers from this. And you know, this entire thing, what I showed you could be done in about an hour's time by a student. So it's not something that will take days to do. So some more examples of topics are optimization of the geometry of a venturi flow meter flow past a bank of cylinders and so forth. So, you know, quite substantial projects can be given. And my experience has been that students really enjoy these type of projects and they do spend a lot of time and it does enhance their understanding of uh, fluid mechanics. So here the message is that open source software is very simple to download, install and use. We can solve reasonable scale problems even on a laptop. In fact, most of the simple simulations that I showed, I do on my laptop. And it gives students some hands-on experience and the exposure can be very useful for solving problems in industry. So, you know, they can take this knowledge and go and do it. So let me just conclude by saying the future will see greater use of computation in chemical engineering, both in research as well as in education. The availability of low cost multi-core CPUs and cloud computing, along with powerful open source software is making large scale computation widely accessible for research. And I think, you know, our colleagues can really get into this in a big way. And we can integrate these things into our curriculum 
to provide very nice tools for teaching in many subjects of chemical engineering. So I only talked about a subset, but uh, many of these things can be done. And I see that the future is quite bright uh, for using this and making a major contribution uh, to the field. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, then I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Professor Kakkar, for the wonderful talk. Um, once again, I'll request the participants to use the raise hand function if you have any questions. Uh, and I'll request Professor Sutra to take up questions from the audience. Uh, uh, very nice talk, talk indeed, uh, Professor. Uh, let's have first question from uh, uh, Jindal Shah. Jindal Shah, please go ahead. Uh, you are... Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's a privilege to be here. I'm a faculty member at uh, Oklahoma State University. Uh, and Professor Kakkar uh, was my faculty advisor when I did my uh, undergrad at IIT Bombay. So it's really nice to see his talk. And uh, uh, Professor Kakkar, thank you for mentioning LAMS. Uh, my research is in molecular modeling and simulations. It was nice to see. So, uh, like, you know, I, I had a question on, like, you know, how uh, one can... Um, you know, do widespread uh, computation in chemical engineering. IIT Bombay is probably like you know, fortunate that like you know, there are a lot of resources, computational resources, but some of these calculations when we run LAMPs or like, you know, uh, CFD packages, uh, they, they can take days and, uh, you know, months uh, depending on the problem. So like, you know, what kind of infrastructure uh, would we want in India so that like, you know, some of these things that you talked about pervade like, you know, uh, to like, you know, pretty much everywhere uh, in India. Well, uh, you're right. But you know, what is actually happening is that, uh, in a sense, you have to pick your problem so that it sort of fits your infrastructure. And uh, in many of the problems, you can sort of build the bare bones thing and work out most of the details using smaller systems, and then scale up and run some of the longer jobs. And uh, you know what is happening is that now more and more, say for example, CDAC in India is actually permitting people to apply for projects and take time on the system. And you can go and buy time on Amazon if you have a grant or something like this. So I feel that it would be quite widely accessible. And uh, one of the things that I've been doing is that you know there are lots of old PCs in our lab and what I've done is I've loaded Linux on all of them. And uh, though they are like five and maybe even older, five years or older computers, and they run quite slowly, but you know, because it's multi-core, all of them are something like three or four, I mean, four cores or two cores or whatever. So you can submit jobs and you don't care. Let it take two days to run, but you know, it gets done. So I have some of the students, uh, particularly the undergraduate students doing projects are working on those. But what I found is that now, say for example, uh, you know, AMD has got these new machines with 64 cores and so forth, which I mean, you know, it's really speeding things up. And then at the institute level, there is the larger supercomputer where, you know, you have thousands of cores, so you can do the scaled up job there. But you're right, this is a real concern. And uh, of course, if you're doing molecular modeling, then what you would like to do is get on to Anton and uh, you know submit a few jobs there so that you can really go for the longer times. Thank you, Professor Hakkar. Okay, so uh, we have a next question from uh, one of our alumnus, uh, Arun Dravid. Arun Dravid, if you can... Uh, 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 ask your question, uh, please go ahead. Otherwise, I will read out from the chat box. Okay, so then let me read out his question. From Sir, you are on mute. Mr. Arun Dravid, you are on mute. Uh, I can uh, <coughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> read the question I have sent on the chat. I, I read it, I read it. Okay, oh, fine. I, I think yeah. this has been, uh, you know, I think this has been an issue throughout. I can mean, you, he said you, the, you, the, rules. Oh, the okay. question is that uh, you know I have fi been finding it troublesome that in recent pa in the recent past students are relying more and more on computing software and are losing sight of the physics of the system. Correct. They are designing. 
how do we ensure that students are driven slowly by applying software while losing sight of what physically happens thermodynamically kinetically or transport fundamentals point of view excellent question. inside a distillation or adsorption column or in a reactor and i no, think excellent yeah. question excellent so this is certainly an issue that has been there throughout i mean even when we were using calculators it was the same thing and now it is even more i mean you can use this software completely like a black box you need to understand nothing about it and simply uh, you know uh, generate a mesh put it in there get some results and mostly they come as these beautiful color plots so yeah this is a real challenge and i think for uh, teachers and for the students themselves uh, it's really important to be able to use these tools to try and understand what is going on rather than just the end in itself and of course the second big problem is that you can't just trust everything that comes out of this because uh, there are obviously limits to all this software that they work in a certain range of parameters and if you exceed that and so you need an understanding of that so this is a really great uh, question and it's very important but at the same time uh, we can't keep students away from this kind of these kind of tools because they're becoming so useful and i don't think there's any industry where they will not be using them well yeah can i add a little comment on that okay. um i have now retired as chairman of jacobs but in in my past uh, the usual problem do used to be of incoming younger generation engineers uh, joining let's say a chemical engineering design group where uh, there was an appalling lack of understanding and even a feel for the physics or chemistry of the system where if you just to give you a little small question if you're designing a distillation column and say okay we are not getting the the kind of purity or kind of uh, throughput we need so what would happen if i change the feed location from tray 15 to tray 19 can you just guess physically can you just give me an off hand answer okay, okay yeah that's worth trying now the the young gen, young young generation chemical engineers working on such problems would draw a complete blank they would have no clue i'm just giving a very rudimentary example of to change the location of the input of the feed by four four plates up or four plates down in what way would that even qualitatively affect the so this is just a small example but the, my 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 uh, concern is that the young generation of chemical engineering education uh, ed, students coming out of chemical engineering education are more and more simply driven by taking a ready made software applying it putting the inputs getting the outputs and they have no clue of any equipment or any process they are trying to design what is the physics what is the thermodynamics what's the kinetics behind what goes on in that in equipment or in that process this is the concept yeah uh, sure, can right. i think in, that's uh, a real danger yeah dr can mashinkar can i come in here uh, devan yes please yeah arun what you have asked is so fundamental i'll tell you my worry is even bigger the bigger worry i'll illustrate by an example just couple of months ago one grandfather bought his 8 year old son to me i said why he said i don't know what to do with him i said why he says he knows everything so i said what is your favorite subject he talked about biology and so on arun you cannot believe it he knew what mrna is he knew the spike protein he could discuss intelligently so many things with me and basically what also happened was that then i had my photograph with watson you know who won the nobel prize for dna structure i showed it to him he didn't recognize him because he was old but then when i told him he said yeah these three people uh, won it but the fourth one who gave the x-ray diffraction should have been 8 year old 8 year old then i asked the father because he father is not scientist grandfather is also not scientist i said how come he knows so much he said no google is his guru we have given him google as free so arun what is happening is that brain is becoming now not a processor but a storage so as to say when google becomes a guru so the point that you raised is extremely important but we will have to trace it back 
the way this uh, uh, system is going to uh, sort of move forward, honestly. Hi, so let me bring in uh, Ruyintan. Ruyintan, please go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, I'm a old dog in chemical engineering, graduated from IIT Bombay in 1970. Uh, and uh, yes, studied under the iconic N.R. Kamath. So here is a question that relates to all three uh, professors, um, Mashalkar, uh, Sharma, and Devang Kakkar. I obviously know Devang very well, and I had the good fortune of having Professor Sharma on my home paper, uh, <laughs> Defense way back in 1970. The question is, when I was a young budding chemical engineer and more or less I followed the chemical engineering profession all the way through my entire professional life in the US, chemists were considered on the top of the heap. I mean, we were an absolute number one uh, to be sought after in India. Now, fast forward 50 years, we are not even remotely close in number five or number six amongst the budding young engineers joining IITs, UDCT or ICT as it's called now. So what can you folks think about doing? Because if you don't get the cream de la cream, what happens to all these, you know, great in, you know, innovations, experimentation and so on? What's the future of chemical engineering? Everybody seems to get a job in working for one or the other IT, irrespective of whether they are a chemi or not. Can each of you please expound on that? Thank you. We'll let our guru go first. <laughs> yeah. there is a, I think what has happened, a computer science is the byword. And when many people come to me for advice, I tell them go to a main discipline. Because in any discipline, the competence in computers comes. So you have domain knowledge plus the knowledge of computers, which you can add on later on. People who do only computer science have no background of any hardcore engineering. Therefore, they are found wanting in solving uh, real problems in engineering, any branch of engineering. So, you know, this whole fancy and parents drive the kids to go for um, computer science uh, because they think the fellow will get a very good job. All you do is keep on punching, keep on doing this and, uh, and you get better salary. Then you get an expensive wife and engineering which they studied gone forever. Then many get lured by IIMs because they have a flying start. All IMs are thriving on engineers. It's a pity that engineering is doing everything that you can see, but they're not getting the recognition. You know, these management fellows go get away with saying that there is an MBA. They don't talk about that is previous 70% of the chaps in the most famous IIMs are engineers. So the question is, this still depends on the area of the country. I think the people in ICT still get very good um, students for chemical engineering and even for chemical technology. And I would partially blame the faculty all over the country. They don't go and explain to the budding students the efficacy of chemical engineering, the role of chemical engineering, chemical industry in society, how, when I said in my opening statement, no branch of engineering has made that great an impact on quality of life. Today, people use simple words, you know, PSA, PSA, not knowing what is PSA and how PSA came in. Everybody is benefiting from that oxygen from PSA. So we also have some responsibility in telling people that how important is, uh, is this area. In my introductory lecture to people who come, I always link chemical engineering to human body. Everybody will be interested in human body. And I explain every facet of chemical engineering, how relevant it is in the human body. And the students get excited uh, knowing that, oh, how relevant it is oxygen absorption in blood or flow of uh, the most complicated problem of fluid mechanics are in the expanding, contracting uh, veins of blood. And that too, non-Newtonian fluid. 
let, let someone solve that complicated problem, you know. Uh, so it is where it stands. But let me tell you, many people do not know. One of my early PhDs was completely, first completely theoretical PhD thesis by P.A. Ramachandran, then who wrote treatises on mathematical methods in chemical engineering. All were analytical solutions. R.D. Maskar did everything which was computational. Completely theoretical thesis, but all by computational work and computer that CDC 3600 was available only in TIFR and he would get time past midnight. He will go there and, and solve, his, um, uh, solve his problem. But what happens in these cases, they don't get the kind of right training as an engineer. So I found out later on, let the partial problem be theoretical, but they must do some experimental work. After all, engineering is lively thing you have to solve. And somebody was saying, no, you crank out the solution fellow, doesn't know the diameter is referring to in the extraction column is absurd. Doesn't have a feel that what is the value of a meter diameter extraction column. He just says, my calculation show the diameter. I said, you realize what is three meter diameter extraction column? So, you know, the feel for the subject, what you call feel of an engineer, you look at a cooling tower, you should be able to tell what is the approximate capacity or so. That, unless you train your students properly, the teacher has a big role to play from the science to practice. You must combine science to practice. And I try to tailor make my talk to show how good science is used to deliver results. Yeah. So let me come in here after Guruji. I think you, uh, you have said uh, what, what is absolutely right. Let me say the following. You know, this Queen Elizabeth Prize of Engineering, when I got on the jury, their concern is a very different one from ours because they're the best minds don't go to engineering. In our case, engineering and medicine is the first preference. So the very first question that was asked to me was, uh, how do we, in the very first interview, how do we make engineering as a kind of a go-to career? And I remember telling them that if you start projecting engineer as uh, one who will build a road or build bridge, that's not going to work. That's not exciting. But you have to tell them that an engineer builds a bridge between science and the society. It's the way you project. That's point number one. So this is engineering in general. Coming to chemical engineering, it's very interesting that uh, 20th century, at the end of the 20th century, there was a public poll that was done in terms of what is the greatest breakthrough that has had the greatest impact in the 20th century. And then you would imagine it would be ice engine, it would be integrated circuit, etc. None of that. They said Haber-Bosch process, ammonia. Because if those fertilizers were not there, uh, some of us will not be there, or many of us will not be there, so as to say. So it is the way you project a sort of a profession. And the last point I must, because Arun is here, and we have been old friends, I must tell you, uh, even uh, perhaps my Guruji doesn't know. I became a chemical engineer by accident. No, I know this story of uh, Arun. You know the story. In fact, Arun, you will remember that I had taken admission in mechanical engineering in VGT, okay? And as on the top of the list, because uh, you had stood first in inter science, I had stood second. So you went to IIT. So I was naturally on the top. And then I was standing at a bus stop at Pratana Samaj, and Arun was going in his car and he stopped. And then I asked him, What are you going to do? He said, I'm going to chemical engineering. In fact, I asked him, What is chemical engineering? I had not heard about it. And then he explained to me, because I said, You know, I don't like chemistry, a lot of mugging, etc. He said, No, you got nothing to do with it. And you know, at that time, he explained to me heat transfer, mass transfer, fluid dynamic, and the rest of it, etc. Because he had the advantage. I think uh, your father had, uh, 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 I mean, he knew GM number and you had sort of visited it. So I think you can just uh, imagine I'm a chemical engineer by accident that I'm sort of uh, talking to you. So it is what you tell uh, the, these young people. I think we have to create uh, uh, that uh, thrill and fun and uh, so on and so forth. Anyway, I will, I will stop here. Thank you. Dr. Ron, great to see you. You're looking fine. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think uh, I'd just like to say exactly what Professor Sharma and uh, Dr. Masharkar said, that 
actually at that age when they are just leaving school students have a really very little idea of what the different engineering professions are they they don't even know what is engineering actually uh, but they get pushed into various disciplines uh, just by you know parents saying nahi go to this this gives you better placement or something like this and i i think that you know we would rely on even alumni to sort of see the way it works there are two ways in which the students get information one is uh, through their parents and other is through their seniors and you know if we are able to convince even those within the campus that okay this is really a great field and you know give examples like yours who have uh, done so well uh, i think that we can pull them in uh so right now if you go by je ranks uh, we you know we are you know after we are number 4 in terms of when the ranks close because currently computer science electrical and mechanical are preferred over chemical but we do see you know after the first year quite a few students change branch into chemical from other fields Uh, because you know they realize it's quite attractive and uh, i think that uh, you know we are but, we are attracting but, quite good students judging at least but, from the ones who are in the class that i teach they but really devang in the us still chemical engineering is number one in terms of starting salaries that's true whereas that's not the case i mean even ahead of computer science of course that's not the case in india so what it means is one lack of branding which the institute of chemical engineers should take up and number 2 <laughs> convincing the big shots in the industry that chemical engineers need to be at par and i'm going to shut up i think i've said my piece on the humorous side you may might remember our chemin progress month had an article the title was chemical engineers make good husbands <laughs> yeah that's a good way of branding <laughs> actually in in the us to correct you just a little bit ron um the the highest uh, paid people are the petroleum engineers but uh, i have maintained uh, much to the anger of my colleagues in petroleum engineering that petroleum engineering is just a subset of chemical engineering <laughs> and they didn't like that one bit and I, i'm sorry for some reason my my video is has been stopped by admin and i can't get them to put it back so uh, you can't see me waving at you but i must tell you my story that from jodhpur i was a lone chap looking for chemical engineering although there was civil engineering in jodhpur i refused to i had a rank in the university i refused to uh, read i never applied even and even though i had financial problems i came there were philanthropists who helped me but i came by design because of interest in chemistry and mathematics 1954 nobody tutored me forget about my father telling me anything i had no pentest idea <laughs> and the college teachers also didn't have much idea i went to two teacher one of physics one of chemistry they were i also drew blank from them you know sometimes fate decides many things you know oh yeah accident if i was not standing on that bus stop <laughs> i would be in bjti <laughs> deepak kudos to you for being such a great yeah, because, uh, uh, thank you very much sir because yeah. we must thank you well done, for well done, uh, your energy enthusiasm and making it happen well, fantastic jaise hindi mein kehte hai na maza aa gaya aaj deepak sir i am honored Bye. The presence of all three of you, excellent presentation. Uh, couldn't have asked for more. Can Anika. we take one last question? Leja has yeah. raised her hand. So, Professor Leja Hatangidi is uh, teaching yeah. digital chemical engineering to our students now. So, Satish has the question. So, let him. I have the question. Oh, okay. Satish, go ahead. Uh, Both alumni of IIT Bombay. After. listening to mm M. sharma for so many years i have one point where i can tell him something 
it is not only that they make better husbands they also make better wives <laughs> you know, we are we are often counselors we are often counselors you know they'll come old, old student both the ways huh? boy as well as girl how do you think i said i think very well <laughs> you know, i participated in match making uh, all my life because they come to know that person studied in university so let us go and ask there's some guy in the university how that boy was or that one so i think on that self congratulatory note uh, we can all good things have to come to an end i suppose yeah thank you yeah. very much sir thank you sir thank, thank you. you varun can you take yeah. over sure yeah. thank you thank you very much uh, that uh, so sir we please the end of this wonderful event um i'd like to invite professor suhas joshi dean acr to present virtual mementos to the speakers and deliver the formal vote of thanks well i think uh, it was a great uh, great event uh, thank you to all the stalwarts um, and uh, of course the real hero uh, behind all these programs is deepak uh, himasiga and you know few days back i mean few months back we were just talking uh, nothing is happening in the uh, in our kama chair professorship let's do something and uh, while talking he started and you know this particular program came in and within next 24 hours he said i have talked to three professors and they are ready to you know uh, make this program happen and you guys uh, go ahead and organize this uh, so my office in iit bombay holds this chair professorship supported by deepak himasinga and his team we have 34 named chair professorships in the institute and institute itself has added 34 more institute chair professorships to recognize the Uh, professors uh, eminence among the um, eminence among the faculty members so thank you all uh, professor sharma professor mashilkar it was great inter um, uh, interacting with you professor kakkar after long time we were uh, listening to you it was very nice and uh, of course uh, thanks to audience i mean they came in great numbers uh, uh, defeating our uh, initial uh, guess uh, we thought 500 have registered but more than uh, more than that i think 300 people um, uh, participants have joined thank you very much for your support and we look forward to similar support uh, uh, in coming future these are couple of uh, few mementos from our side these are e pictures i mean e mementos nowadays you know we can't give but we can and we can post i mean we can send you these um, uh, pictures of the institute by email after the program is uh, done so thank you again all of you and of course our director also was there at the beginning so thank you to him also for uh, giving some introductory remarks so can you show these pictures a little better and then we can end varun Samanwar, can you make it full screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So this is for Professor Sharma. Yeah. <laughs> There's a collection of all the you know iconic buildings in the institute. So we'll mail it to them by tonight. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Go to the next one. Thank oh, you. same, same. I think yeah, it is the same. Yeah, the pictures are same. Yeah. Thank you all, and thank you thank all. Thank you.